Hey everybody, it's Captain Kyle. I'm here with the amazingly talented John Billingsley at Shore Lee 42. How are you doing? Do I get to talk to the microphone too? Thank you very much, microphone hog. I am peachy keen, Kyle. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. One of my favorite cons. So I do need to ask, what got you into acting? Give me that microphone. All right. Well, it all started back when I was in the womb. I started acting actually in the fifth grade in uh, my school in Connecticut. We had moved to Connecticut from Louisiana. I taught like this. I had thick southern drawl, and all the northern children just loathed me. But I was a big reader. So when they had mandatory auditions for the school play, I was the only kid who could pick up the script and actually read the words with any degree of... of of, you know, passion, even intelligence. So I was cast as Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. And for one brief shining moment, I experienced personal glory. And that made me decide this acting thing, it's for me. So it was purely, it was meretricious reasons. It wasn't based on the art. It was based only on personal egotism. Eventually, I became somebody who fell in love with it for other reasons. But my initial attraction was vain, pure vain glory. Isn't that awful? Are you sure you want to even keep talking to me? I want to talk to you more, because I actually grew up in Connecticut as well. A nutmegger. Exactly. Whereabouts in Connecticut were you? I grew up in Stratford. Oh, yes. I was Weston. Weston, Connecticut. Yeah, not too far away. Not too far away. Of course, it's a small state. It is. Were you below or above the Yankee-Boston Red Sox line? I was on the border because my cousin, to this day, is a diehard Red Sox fan, and my sister is a diehard... Yankees fan. And for some reason, my brother likes the Mets. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a clear line of delineation in Connecticut. We were in the New York metropolitan region, so we were New York fans. And I was a Mets fan. Big Mets fan for years. Now I'm a huge Dodgers fan. I've been in L.A. for 27 years. Nobody really cares about my baseball passion, so I, I realize this isn't even a question. Sometimes what happens is that you think you're going to ask me questions, and I just answer my own questions, and you never get a word in edgewise. Well, that's fine. Just, do you want me to just give you the mic and you can just talk to the camera? I could, but then, no, I would feel like I'd neutered you. I don't want to do that. That would be cruel of me. So, you had a Connecticut-centric question, didn't you? Well, actually, I was wondering, how did someone from Connecticut get involved in, like, productions? Because Connecticut, I mean, New York is close. Was that where you were first doing productions, or...? You know, believe it or not, you can move freely across the state lines. Has anybody, Wait, what, what? Yes, yes. Has anybody informed you of this? I realize there's a healthy contingent of people in the country that are going to try and resist that in the future, but generally speaking, we still have freedom of movement. So I didn't stay in Connecticut. Okay, that's what I was actually wondering. Were you still in Connecticut when you started your more media career, or did you move? No, it's safe to say that you can't accomplish shit in Connecticut. Not just not Connecticut, it's a beautiful state. But generally speaking, you're not going to have much of a career as a nutmegger in my, bit, in my business. You can get in and out of New York, but you'd kind of have to be insane to try. Yeah, well, I'm not in Connecticut anymore either, so we're, we're both on the same page. We all, we, but we, here's the Connecticut! Connecticut! The poor man's Rhode Island! Yeah, but they gave me a ticket in Rhode Island. Anyway, um, prior to acting, what, what did you do for jobs? Well, I was a child. I didn't have to work. I was a child. I, I, I sucked off the tit of my parents. That, that's a good place to be. Yes. Once I started acting, I actually was able to make a living out of it uh, right from the get-go, but I learned how to live like a poor person, which I've, I've always, much as I don't care much for J David Mamet's politics of late, he did write a very, I thought, interesting book about, about acting and about, to a certain extent, what it takes to become an actor. And one thing he said that I think is very true is if you have a fallback position, you will fall back on it. So I never had a fallback position. So I was bound and determined to be an actor, and that's all I've ever done. As Richard Horvitz has said, take the leap, the net will appear. Excellent. Now I can quote him instead, because I'm sick of quoting David Mamet. So I loved your appearance in SG1. Do you have any experience that, experiences from that particular uh, project that you want to share? Uh, that episode was called The Other Guys, and it was about two doofuses who think they're out to save the day, but in fact just screw things up royally with the team. And I had the great pleasure of working with a gentleman named Patrick McKinnon, I believe, was his last name, a fabulous Canadian actor. 
I adored working with him. He was such a gentleman, a funny guy, a warm guy, and dare I say this, a bit of a dope smoker. <laughs> um, it's legal now. It's legal now. Patrick, I'm sorry. If you were trying to keep that a secret, I've just outed you. Um, we had a blast. Unfortunately, they used him again, and they didn't use me again. I don't know why. The bastards, exactly. So I had a lovely time uh, on the set, and I only wish I could have gone back for more. We wish you had gone back for more as well. How did you get involved with one of my favorite movies ever, The Man from Earth? Uh, a gentleman named Richard Schenkman, who was a director, contacted me. He was a Star Trek fan. He asked me if I'd be interested. I said, sure. Big fan of the writer Jerome Bixby, who wrote the script. Um, I actually had a big role in helping to cast it because some of the people who were in it dropped out and I suggested the replacements, Ellen Crawford and Dick Reilly, both of whom were friends of mine. Um, they had a budget of $9, so it was not an effects-driven film. It is very much a shaggy dog tale told by a fireplace story. For those who haven't seen it, I think it's a lovely movie about the difference between being spiritual and being religious. And I'll leave it at that. I think it's a charmer. Definitely a charmer. And you had a brief scene in the sequel, Holocene. Is there going to be a third? I don't know if there's going to be a third, you know, and I don't mean this uh, disrespectfully. I think I'm not a huge sequel guy, generally speaking. It's like, I don't want to see Casablanca 2. So I applaud Richard's desire to keep the spirit of that story alive. Personally, I think you did it. Walk away. One man's opinion. If Richard, if you're watching this, you know I love you, and you know I'm still going to cash the residual check. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I would say the first one is superior to the second, but, you know, it brought out some interesting things. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, again, I, I think you catch lightning in a bottle with the original and I think you begin to have the law of diminishing returns, with the exception of Godfather 2. There's always exceptions. That's about the only one. French Connection 2, maybe. So, to your start, since we're at a shore leave Star Trek, you know, originated convention, how long did it take for them to put you into makeup each, uh, each day? What makeup? On Enterprise? You just... That's what I look like, Kyle. Oh, you're in makeup now. I'm sorry. I did not understand. No. It took about two and a half hours and then a half an hour, 40 minutes. I have to say the look of panic on your face was charming, though. About 45 minutes to take off. Irritating, but not, you know, so irritating as to make me not want to do it. The fake contact lenses were somewhat of a pain because they really did irritate my eyes. So if there was anything that I would have wished to be different, it would have been that. But minor quibble. Yeah. Well, but understandable. It's your eyes. I also had a pretty cushy job. I was number seven on the call sheet. I wasn't the guy who had to take punches and woo alien babes. I only worked like one day a week. So I had a little song I used to sing. Day off. Day off. Six days off and the checks still come. Character actor in the sun. Six days off and the checks still come. So you've been to a number of these things. Is there an experience with a fan that really springs to mind that stood out? There was a convention in San Francisco when I was licked head to toe by two young ladies named Raspberry and Boysenberry or Strawberry and Blueberry. They actually wanted to come on stage and give Dominic a kiss. And instead, they gave him a licking. And I kind of was like, what am I, chopped liver? At which point, they proceeded to lick me. It's like, I didn't actually want to be licked. I was just making a joke. But they were young, and they were enthusiastic. And it's, it's hard to stop yourself from getting licked by people when they're bound and determined to lick you. So my wife was not too happy with that. She said, I want a no-licking rule from here on in. So I, I should have known. As soon as I found out they were named after fruits and vegetables, that they were up to no good. Yeah, that, that would be an iffy situation. Are there any projects coming out that you can talk about? Uh, I'm going to have a very small role in an Apple miniseries called Manhunt, which is filming now. It's about the hunt for Lincoln's assassins. Um, I wouldn't watch it on my account, Blink and You'll Miss Me, but I think it's going to be a very interesting story and some terrific people in and behind it, including Carl Franklin, who directed me in a film called Out of Time, 
many years back with Denzel Washington. Such a lovely, lovely man. We'll keep an eye out for you. We'll not blink at all for the entire... Don't blink at all. Don't get up to go to the bathroom. That might be my scene. And anything you would like to say to your fans before we wrap it up? Well, sure. How about this? I also am one of the um, leaders of a not-for-profit called the Hollywood Food Coalition, which helps rescue and share food with about 100 other not-for-profits in and around Los Angeles. Check us out online at hofoco.org and have your antenna up in the air because we will be doing, again, for the second year, Trek Talks, which is a digital fundraiser to support Hollywood Food Coalition. I am the host, a la Jerry Lewis. Look for that in January and think about supporting us. Thanks so much. Thank you. And the link is down in the description, so you can just go down there and click. John, thank you so much That's for, awesome. and uh, everyone out there, thank you for watching. As always, have fun and follow your fandom. Hi, this is Bonnie Gordon, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self-destructs in five, four, three, two, one. Just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.